We are firmly into June, which means that summer is here and we need now more than ever a quick, easy, and delicious drink to enjoy in the hot summer weather. As a result, we are going to take today's episode of Mike's Heart Reviews to look at Cachaça and the national drink of Brazil, the Caipirinha. Hey there, hi there, ho there. My name is Michael. I am a bartender from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and today we're going to take a look at Brazil's national spirit and the national cocktail that they make with it, known as Cachaça and the Caipirinha, respectively. Now, this is the first time that we've looked at a place's national spirit, and you're probably hearing that name Cachaça and going, what exactly is that? Cachaça is a spirit, much like rum, that is distilled from sugar, but is distinct from rum in a very, very important way in terms of its specific distillate. Most rums are made using uh, a byproduct from the predation of granulated sugar called molasses. Cachaça, instead of using that molasses as its base, ferments sugar cane juice taken from fresh pressed cane sugar and uses that to distill their creation, which technically makes it a rum if you define a rum as the overarching category of liquors made from distillates of sugar, but there's some more complex relationship between that distillate base and the resulting product than would allow for that definition to be accurate. Basically, cachaça is to rum what scotch is to whiskey. Rum comes from different places. Brazilian rum is cachaça, much the way that scotch whiskey or scotch is a form of whiskey from Scotland. And in that same way, cachaça can actually only be made in Brazil. It is their national spirit, and it is a regional appellation that requires it be made in Brazil. Now, cachaça production begins as early back as the 1500s, the 16th century. Uh, I found one account of it being made starting in 1532, following the Portuguese uh, transportation of pot stills to Brazil, following westward expansion uh, and the whole spice trade thing that all those nations did back in the day. Since then, cachaça has been wildly popular. Uh, in fact, of all of the cachaça that is produced, 99% of it is drunk by Brazilians. It is so wildly popular in their nation that it has basically stood the test of time as their dominant primary spirit and really the only one they rely on super, super heavily. It's funny too, because that 99% of cachaça that is drunk by them, the remaining 1% is export. All of that to the rest of the world is export. And apparently, as of 2003, most of it goes to Germany, which made no sense to me and it is really baffling. <laughs> Uh, despite that very small amount of export consumption, uh, cachaça is becoming more and more common around the world, particularly in America, uh, Mexico, uh, and I believe Puerto Rico, actually, which is really fascinating because of proximity, I suppose. Uh, thanks to well-stocked, uh, you know, specialty liquor stores and the, you know, cocktail mixology renaissance, people are looking to find more interesting ingredients to work with, and cachaça has become one of them, so we're starting to experience a bit more of it. Uh, cachaça comes in two different varieties, uh, and I have them written down here in Portuguese. I do not speak Portuguese, so <laughs> give me a uh, give me a bit of a bit a bit of leeway here. Uh, so it comes in two varieties, an aged and an unaged uh, variety. The unaged variety is referred to as branca or pruta, meaning white or silver, uh, or uh, and the aged is known as uh, amarelo or oro, which means yellow or gold, respectively. Um, essentially referring to their color the same way that rums can sometimes be referred to, or tequilas can be referred to. Think about the way Bacardi refers to their rums. You've got Bacardi silver and you've got Bacardi gold. Bacardi gold is like a lightly aged form of their rum. And, it, it, and look, I know I said that cachaça is distinct from rum, and it is. I keep referring to it though, because as a spirit, even though it is distinct, a lot of the rules regarding its aging and its presentation in cocktails are actually really, really similar. Cachaça, though I have never had it, I have read, has a very vegetal, green, occasionally fruity and subtly sweet flavor that can be funky sometimes, uh, primarily because of pot still distillation. It produces esters that give it that kind of essence. And it reminded me implicitly of Jamaican rum made from molasses and all of its flavor notes, which are different but contain some of those same vegetal funky notes that you find. And when so many of the rules regarding how cachaça is produced are the same as rum, I'm a little lost in the plot, not gonna lie. <laughs> There's a lot to consider. It's a very complicated, uh, you know, relationship between cachaça and rum, and I keep referring to them in as like parallels, 
I don't want you to get confused. This is a distinct thing that Brazil is known for, and it's not the same as like your regular rum off the shelf. That aside complete, uh, there is a bit of a weird relationship with cachaça and import laws, meaning that a lot of cachaça that is available on the market in Brazil cannot be bought here. And as a matter of fact, it is next to impossible to get most of them, but as a result, a lot of cachaça brands are export exclusive, meaning they are only available for purchase in places other than uh, Brazil, which I don't think exists for literally any other spirit as far as I'm aware. So let's go ahead and take a look at the most popular and widely available variety of cachaça in the United States, Novo Fogo. Now this here is a bottle of Novo Fogo. You may have actually seen this at some liquor stores. It's got a very distinct shape to it and this really fascinating like cloth wrapped neck of the bottle. I don't know why. They do that, but they do. This is the most common and actually currently the highest rated cachaça available on the market in the United States, at least by one source, liquor.com. This is their unaged or silver variety of their cachaça, and it is the one to look for if you plan on doing anything revolving around cachaça in the United States. Novo Fogo uh, hasn't been around for very long. Export and uh, export cachaça and export only cachaça specifically uh, hasn't been a very popular concept for a very long time. In fact, Novo Fogo has only been around since 2010. But the reason why it came to be is actually really fascinating in its own right. In its own right, Novo Fogo started as a desire to find an export cachaça company that was USDA grade certified, organic, and uh, focusing on traditional handmade techniques and sustainability. Those three things are their bread and butter at Novo Fogo. In the description down below, there are links to pages on their, pages on their site that will go over their process and how they focus on doing a lot of these things by hand. You know, they're, they're man-made directly, you know, direct from the source, no chemical additives, nothing. They are one of, if not the only, and definitely the first people to be so heavily invested in cachaça as an organic substance. And that is, first of all, super fucking cool because it means that Americans have a chance to get something that is at the baseline, super, super legitimate and in, it, it, directly comparable to what you would find in Brazil. Especially, you know, traditional long-standing brands that exist in Brazil, like Cachaça 51, that's the one that I saw most people referring to outside of the US. Um, something that compares to that without needing to be emulative, it is just that. If they just did that the best way they knew how, which is awesome. Now you might think that uh, a, you know, a spirit like this can be expensive. Not really, actually. You're paying about as much for a bottle of Novo Fogo as you are a you know, good bottle of rum, you know, a good baseline bottle of rum, like a Plantation 3 Star, for example. In the state of Michigan, where I am at this time of year, at the very least, these two bottles are about the same, coming around $30, $35 maybe arranging up to 40 in some places, depending on your you know, regional appellations and your local liquor laws. So it's genuine, legitimate, has a reason for existing outside of just being cachaça. It is you know, an organic product. It is well-made with traditional technique, and it is the one to get here in the States. I have never had it. The only time that I had a chance to try this was while at a bar in Chicago called Three Dots and a Dash. It's a tiki bar located, uh, I think in River North, technically. And they are really cool. They have Novo Fogo um, on their shelves and they do make caipirinhas, but my roommate who I was with at the time ordered a caipirosca, which we'll talk about later uh, instead. So let's go ahead and try Novo Fogo for the first time. So from everything that I've read about this spirit and its profile, the way it presents, the flavors it carries, I'm sort of anticipating this to be the the basic like profile combination of a Blanco tequila and a rum. To sort of hit those vegetal, green, grassy, and occasionally herbal notes you get out of uh, you know a Blanco tequila, you know a very young, unaged tequila, and the sort of sugared impact of rum and the funky esters you get from that distillation process. I'm thinking that's what this is probably going to register as. See if we get a good cork pop. Yeah. <laughs> little, little high on the treble, but that wasn't bad. That wasn't bad. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. 
Whoa, I was, wow, I was right. Wow, hold on, let me pour some of this out. Let's give this a uh, little sniff. Ooh, wow, god damn, that's crazy. So it's really leaning into those funky pot stilled esters that you get, but it's not like a Jamaican rum. Again, the difference in the distillate is making an impact. This is way more cut so like seagrass and uh, this sort of like, oh man, it's hard to describe. It's like funky fruit kind of, like fruit that is starting to go bad. Kind of in the same way that like, Jamaican rum smells like rotting bananas. That is their funky, that is their varietal of funkiness. It's like that, but with if it was like a different fruit, I just can't tell what. There's something about it that it feels tangential to some kind of spice I've had. I wanna say maybe, maybe tamarind? Maybe tamarind, maybe. It's got a really fascinating smell. Honestly, I could sit here smelling this for the next 15 minutes and just keep trying to pick it apart, but it's totally foreign to me. Like, I don't know how to describe it. It's Okay, enough rambling about sommelier shit that I don't really understand. Let's give it a taste. Huh. So, surprisingly smooth. In fact, very, very smooth. Which is like a bad way to describe it, but essentially it's got this really nice full mouthfeel that doesn't feel super oily or super thin. It's not like water or olive oil. It's like right in between where you want it to be for a sipping spirit. And it's got this really nice presentation of all those smells I'm getting that I can't really describe, but it's a lot less volatile on the palate compared to in the nose. Yeah, it feels kind of like um, the essence of citrus peels. You know, it's kind of it's kind of citrusy a little bit. It's got this funkiness to it, um, but I can't tell what kind. I'm not I'm not familiar with it in particular. It's got sort of like a sea salt essence to it, I think, is what my brain is trying to lead me towards. This kind of minerality, actually, that is distinct from tequila, but reminds me of a Blanco tequila. In fact, maybe that is how I want to describe it. It does taste kind of like how the minerals present in agave present when you distill them into tequila. It, it feels kind of similar, actually, which is awesome because I actually like this. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of tequila. I, I'll drink it. It's not my preferred spirit. Um, I think it's fine. And I always keep a bottle in the house at least because I know somebody's gonna want some. This though has this sort of richer, more deep, less high treble character. It's more full bodied and it's got a less sharp minerality to it. Um, it's, it's kind of more matured without actually being any more matured, which is kind of, kind of hilarious actually. Yeah, there's there's really no way to describe that. It really feels like this is the fullest essence of fermented sugarcane juice brought down into a distillate. And I am, I am just blown away. Oh, you know what? I bet that's what it is. So cachaça isn't barrel rested. It's when it's unaged, it's rested in stainless steel. So you are sort of embracing the minerality that copper pot stills provide alongside what is naturally occurring in their distillate. And it does really present this like sweet, kind of metallic sweet note like you get in like a Jameson actually, but without the vanilla, you know, vanilla cookie aspect, it's more like, oh yeah, raw sugar. Not like demerara or turbinado sugar, but like chewing on sugar cane. <laughs> which is probably still actually super sweet now that I think about it. But yeah, this is, this is wild. This might be my new favorite rum. <laughs> well, rum equivalent, I, sorry, that's redu reductive of me. My, my new favorite rum adjacent spirit. So now that we've talked a little bit about the national spirit of Brazil, let's talk about their national cocktail, which uses it proudly, the Caipirinha. Cachaça is the base spirit in the national drink of Brazil, which is called a caipirinha. It's a combination of whole muddled lime, raw sugar, um, and cachaça, and essentially creates um, a smash equivalent sour uh, using their base spirit. In sort of the essence of na national local spirit combined with lime and sugar, um, it's been around for fucking forever. 
<laughs> Scholars think that it's been around for at least as long uh, as since, you know, 1912, you know, the early 20th century, during the time of the Spanish flu, when it sort of evolved as a potential treatment for the disease. Now, that's pretty common for a lot of cocktails, actually. They have sort of medicinal or alchemical roots, which is really fascinating and a whole thing we could talk about separately. But in this particular instance, it wasn't actually effective. <laughs> there are obviously contemporaneous accounts, you know, subjective accounts of it working, but there's nothing about the classic presentation of a caipirinha, which includes not just lime, sugar, and cachaça, but also garlic and I think honey. It's, it's a completely different animal, completely different beast and there's nothing about it that would have actually benefited what they were trying to fight, unlike with the gimlet, you know, where it's just raw vitamin C mixed with alcohol, basically. It doesn't really accomplish that goal, but it has the staying power to become a cocktail that down the line sort of cuts away all that shit you don't need, like the garlic and the honey, and I think it was served hot, um, and makes it something that's actually worth drinking as a modern, respectable cocktail. I didn't focus too much on that concept of um, the Caipirinha, you know, its original roots as a medicinal cocktail, um, but Greg from How to Drink actually did a video on it a super long time ago, and you can actually click the link in the description down below, or I guess I'll put a card um, up here, and um, you can go there and watch his video, because it's actually the first time I ever learned about this drink, and I was like, I'm probably never gonna drink that, but it sounds really cool, and now I know that there's a real version of it, so we'll do that instead. This sort of modern, pared-down Caipirinha, there is no single creator for. People love it, and it is easily the most popular cocktail in Brazil, and many other places, actually, that have started to put it on their menus. It's a very simple, three-ingredient cocktail with a very particular technique, and we're gonna go ahead and make one now so that I can show you how you do it. So, to make a caipirinha is a actually very simple process and it uses very, you know, simple fresh ingredients and practices. It's very, very simple to construct. So, we're going to begin that now and all you need is some uh, granulated white cane sugar, a whole lime, and two ounces of cachaça. So, let's make a uh, caipirinha. You can do this either in the glass you're going to serve it in or I'm going to put it into a shaker so I can give it a quick blitz to really chill it down and help this sugar dissolve. Uh, aside from that though, not entirely necessary and you can kind of do whatever you want to get these things combined. You're gonna go ahead and combine four teaspoons of granulated sugar. Um, a teaspoon is five mLs, that is exactly the same as a bar spoon. So, four bar spoons of sugar. I'm gonna take our lime here and I'm gonna cut this like so. Now really, you wanna quarter it into four pieces but when you do so, you also wanna pay attention to the center of each quarter that you are creating. The sort of white fleshy bits in the inside of citrus is called the pith. And there's a nice big thick section of it in the center of most quartered citrus pieces like this one, for example. And you do not want that in the cocktail. You're gonna take that, trim it right off. The pith is essentially an extension of the peel. It has a lot of bitterness in it, but it has none of the essential oils that you want in the cocktail. So you trim that off to avoid making the drink too bitter, but and you know allow us to muddle the whole thing and still get those oils out. Repeat that process with all of our quarters and toss those into our shaker. And before we add our cachaça, I'm going to give these a nice firm squeezing. You don't want to you know bruise them too hard and extract too much lime oil from the peels because uh, it'll make it too bitter. Um, but you do want to get them nice and macerated and get that sugar starting to evolve, evolve, to dissolve into the uh, lime juice. Once we've got that good and started, we're gonna go ahead and add our two ounces of cachaça. That's all we need to add, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab some ice to very briefly shake this to chill it down. Now, the thing about using whole sugar in cocktails is that it will never, never, literally never dissolve completely. This is a traditional preparation which would use a granulated sugar. So rather than shaking this a bunch until it eventually dissolves and ultimately over diluting the cocktail, we are literally just gonna crack a single cube in here to get it real cold, and then we are done. We are talking a max eight seconds of shaking. So one cube cracked, I'm gonna throw our cap on there and just give that a quick That's it. We're gonna take our glass, and this is the one I was using before. Um, this is not one of those cocktails you're gonna wanna strain off. You actually just want to open pour that directly in. We're gonna top that up with a little bit of 
extra ice. Let me give it just a little bit of a lime wheel for the sake of having a rim. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Kuiperinia. And with our station cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our Kuiperinia a taste. I do not know the Brazilian equivalent of cheers, uh, so I'll say it in French instead. Not correct, but salut. <laughs> oh man, that is so good. Ooh, that's got evolution, I like that. It's nothing like a daiquiri. I'm gonna put that out there right away. It's got, you know, that very familiar fresh lime note, but the addition of these essential oils from the peel being rested in the drink and, and the whole grain sugar not fully dissolving and providing a very raw sugar-like character in combination with those very funky notes in the cachaça, nothing like it. It's, it's so distinct and fascinating and it's got this really bold and like tart, but very candy-like character to it. And this very mature spirit flavor, very prominently on display from that cachaça. Oh man, I'm in danger. <laughs> I'm in danger. Oh man, it is bright and refreshing and it doesn't hold back that spirit at all. If anything, the spirit is sort of elevated by providing it this little bit of sweetness and zest to sort of complement those mineral mineral flavors built into it. And, oh, wow. <laughs> there are these moments I've had throughout my life where I take a sip of a cocktail in just the right, you know, moment in how I am feeling and what I am experiencing and saying and who I am with and what am I, what I am doing that my brain goes, you are at peace. Not that I'm dead or not that I'm gonna die or anything, but like, I'm at peace. <laughs> this is a cocktail that has done that without the need for company or music or liveliness in and of itself. It has made me feel at ease and not in a boozed up way. And that is fucking cool as shit. Holy fuck. It's just nice and light. And, and rich and full-bodied and tasty. And I, I could see myself getting very, very drunk on these the next time I go to Chicago. In fact, I'm going to see Tony Baker and Kev on stage in Chicago this August. I am probably going to make it an overnight trip so I can go back to Three Dots and a Dash and get absolutely cranked off these damn things. Oh man. Try this, because it is distinct. You're, I'm not, honestly, the more I sip it, the less I see it as a rum. Like the sort of erroneous, you know, legal labeling of cachaça as a rum for the sake of convenience does not do it justice. The more and the more I sip it, the more I'm like, no, this isn't the same thing. This isn't remotely similar. This is so distinct in very key and important ways. Like, no, no shot, no dice. So I had a couple of fun facts. Um, about cachaça that um, there, some of them are in Portuguese, so I'm pulling up my notes. So cachaça goes by like, I think roughly 2000 nicknames over the, over the many, the many, many, many actually centuries it has been around. Um, it has gone through many, many different titles and names and nicknames. Uh, I wanted to read a couple of these names to you and I'm gonna read them in my best possible Portuguese <laughs> uh, because funnily enough, a lot of spirits go by some of these names, some very similar names. Some of these are uh, Agua Benta, which is uh, holy water. I'd be probably, could probably put that one together. There's a, uh, oh God, I wrote it too small and I can't quite read it. I think it's uh, uh, Bafo, de, de ti, Bafo de Tigre, which is tiger breath. <laughs> tiger breath. And that one, that one feels mean. Uh, I, I feel like that's, that's mean. Ooh, wait, no, I think I get it. That stainless steel resting does give it that metallic note. They're probably hearkening to that metallic note. That makes sense, I like that. Finally, the one that, <laughs> the one that gave me pause and made me go, yikes, <laughs> was um, Limpo Olo, which means eye wash in Portuguese. Um, and ow, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where that comes from. Um, this isn't like an eye watering, incredibly powerful, painful spirit. Um, 
I, I dread to think of where that name came from. So that is Cachaca and the Caipirinha, uh, a cocktail national to Brazil and one that they are not only incredibly proud of, but one that everybody at home should go out of their way to try at least once. So before we uh, head out for the day and go about our merry ways, um, it is time for our per episode reading from Crisp Toasts, the wonderful words that add wit and class to every time you raise your glass. How about kiss my ass? We are continuing from our section, Absent Friends, where like I said, we're going alphabetical and the book is sorted into sections uh, alphabetically. So we're stuck there for a bit, but it won't be long before we get to something different. So today's toast goes as thus. Here's to absent friends, particularly to prosperity. <laughs> oh, that's got some dark undertones. <laughs> Here's to absent friends, particularly to prosperity, meaning prosperity is absent. Yikes. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video of Mike's Hard Reviews, and hopefully all of you go out there and have a chance to try a Caipirinha or this coming Tuesday's cocktail, potentially also invented in Brazil, that plays off of this cocktail as a riff. If you like the video, click that like button and subscribe. Those buttons are both down below, and that's the best way to let me know that you're liking the show. Uh, I've noticed a little bit of growth recently, and I'm very, very appreciative of that. Um, hopefully you guys stick around to continue to see what I'm doing. I do have some new stuff coming out, and there is a Pride Month episode in the works. I just needed more time to research it uh, before filming and shooting the video. So um, stick around for that. We will do that by the end of the month. If you want to figure out what else I'm doing, I'm trying to maintain um, activity on socials, in particular TikTok, but I also have a Reddit, Tumblr, and an Instagram that are appearing on the screen right now. The links to all of those are in the description down below. Feel free to follow me. Like I said, I'm not super active, but I'm trying to get better, man. It's really hard. So thank you again for watching. Remember, everybody at home, drink responsibly, and have a great rest of your afternoon. See you all around. Bye-bye.